Now, if you're in to titles, I actually have a title this time. I'm not like a title guy um, because usually I get through, I get to start writing on all this stuff and, and the last thing I think about is a title and I'm like, I don't even know what to title this thing because it goes 94 different directions. But this one is actually settled in one area. So I actually could put a title on this one. The title of this one is Reload. Right? Does anybody feel like we're in a season right now or a time right now where we're ready to reload yourselves, our church? Right now, we've seen God moving in our church a lot lately, right? Like these last, let's say, six months or so. We've really seen God moving and doing miracles in our church. And not only that, but I've seen God moving in a lot of different places rather than just right here at NCC, right? But if you're going to come here, you're going to see God moving here too, because he still does. So for those of you who are asking some people, hey, why don't you come and check out our church? What's different at our church? Come check it out. Come see. Invite those, right? We're not asking for a bunch of people in the church, right? We're asking for a bunch of people out for the kingdom of God, correct? Yes, we are. So keep fishing, all right? Even if they don't come here, that's okay. That's okay. Because we're just asking for people to come live for the kingdom of God, right? That's right. But for real, at this point in our lives, in this season of our lives right now, how many of us are actually looking to like reload spiritually, mentally, emotionally, maybe physically, right? Sometimes we have to reload our lives. Sometimes we have to reload our friends, right? I'll get to the kids in a second. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't forget about you kids. Sometimes we have to reload our, our lives, our friends, right? Kids, listening? Sometimes we have to change our friends. Not change who you hang out with, but maybe change your friends in the way that they're acting, the things that they're doing, the people they're talking about, right? Maybe some of the gossip that goes on, huh? Now, if you can't change your friends, sometimes you have to change your friends, and we've talked about that. So if you can't change your friends, change your friends, right? All right, kids. You can be dismissed to Kids Church. So while they're going, I actually looked up the definition, and you can laugh at me if you want to, but I actually looked up the definition of reload. I was like, huh, I wonder what the definition of reload is. Literally, this is what it says. It means to load something. Okay, well, that made a lot of sense. I'm not sure why I looked at the definition. In my defense, I'm going to say that's what I thought it meant. Okay? So don't be like, well, he's an idiot. That's what I thought it meant. But hey, every now and then you just got to look up the definition. But you know what the word re means? Do it again. So that means you were loaded once before. So that means you were loaded from the beginning. Right? God created you a good creation. So you were loaded from the beginning, but somehow we thought we lost some of that. Maybe we lost that mentality that we were loaded and ready to go. Right? So this is a message. This is a day. This is a time. This is a season. This is the hour to reload. Okay? Just when you feel like you are out, you're out of ammunition. Now is the time to reload and ready to go back again. We're going to be in Isaiah 43, starting in verse 16. Is this NIV? Sweet. Even better. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. All right, so this is a direct reference right here on uh, verse 16 is a direct reference to Exodus 14, 5 through 31, right? If you're wanting to write some stuff down here. So remember in the Exodus, right? The Egyptians went after the Israelites after they left, correct? 
They were at the Red Sea, or the Sea of Reeds is how some translations read it. They were at the, the Red Sea, and the Egyptians were coming, right? And the Israelites saw them coming off in the distance. And what did Moses say? Moses said, stay still and watch the Lord work, right? Well, then God said to Moses, said, move on. And we pretty much was like, well, what are you doing here? I'm, I'm asking you to go forward, keep going, right? So that's when Moses raised his hands above the sea, the water split, and they went across on dry land, right? And the Egyptians followed them, didn't they? And we know what happens, right? They get to the other side. Moses turns around, raises his hands. The waters rush back in. And what happens to the Egyptians? They all die. They're perished. They're there. And actually in verse 17, if you go on, it says it so beautifully. Who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there. Okay, there's four parts to this. Listen to this. They lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Right? Now, God could have just said they were dead, but he didn't. He said so much more than that. Like he went on to explain it four different ways. And I love how it says they lay there, never to rise again, extinguish, snuffed out, right? This is showing the power of God, right? What he can do. You ever wanted that to be so for your enemy? Extinguished, never to rise again. Now, I'm not talking about people when I say enemy because we're called to love people, correct? But the enemy can work through people sometimes. It's not the person, it's the enemy. Now, sometimes the enemy can work through your own life as well, right? Addictions, emotions. Sometimes the enemy can work through that as well. But how many of you have just wanted to lay the enemy down just like that? Never to rise again. Extinguished and snuffed out like a wick. Now, this can dig into spiritual warfare too, right? And if you don't think spiritual warfare is real, uh, think again, read about it again, because it is so real and so impactful in your life, and you've got to know how to fight it. Sometimes we need to reload our spirit, right? Just like we were talking about. We need God to separate our waters in our life and maybe reveal some of the underlying things that are laying in our life that we want to wash clean, Right? That we want to be washed away, taken away when those walls of water come back down, never to rise again, extinguished and snuffed out like a wick. Right? And they lay there. It says the Israelites could see them washing up on shore. They lay there. Right? Never to have to mess with that again. Never to have to see that again. I'll never forget your story, Ryan, when you said you were in the water and you came walking out of the water. Your family was on the shore. Right? And you were the one drowning out there in the water. And you came walking up on shore. Your wife and your kids just wanted you up there. And as you walked up on the shore, you can turn around and look out into that water and say, ah, that's who I used to be. That's where I used to be. But not anymore. That part of my life is extinguished and never to rise again. Verse 18. Here's where it's good. Here's where it really gets good. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Okay, that is 10 words, and somebody probably really needed to hear that today. Like, thank goodness that came through because forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. That makes me feel good. So now we can do what? We can reload here. We're forgetting the former things. We're not dwelling on the past. All right? Now, in Isaiah here, when God wrote this, he's not saying that he wants them to forget about the Exodus, forget about what he did, right? He doesn't want them to completely forget about that, but he also doesn't want them to know that that was his only thing that he could do. That was his only opportunity to free them, to have freedom from something, right? God can give you freedom from a lot of different things, right? In a lot of different ways at a lot of different times in your life. So at some point in time in your life, maybe you have been some other person, right? But you're no longer that person anymore. 
in your life. Because we can go on to verse 19 now. See, I am doing a new thing. That's the future. That's what you have to look forward to. That's the present time you're living in right now. On from there. Okay? We've forgot the past. We don't dwell on what happened anymore. We can live in this present time right now. Correct? We don't have to dwell on that anymore. If you believe verse 18, then you've got to go on to verse 19 and say, see, I am doing a new thing. This is when it gets good. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. It can come fast, right? Because it says now it springs up. That's quick. Now it comes quick. It can come fast, all right? So we have to be ready at any moment in time when God shows up to give a call on your life, right? How many of you have missed it? How many of you have missed it before? And not to say you regretted it, but you just missed it. Okay, well, if you have missed it, that's okay. Because we can go back and we can say, all right, you're right. I'm not going to dwell on the past because, see, I am doing a new thing and I'm ready for that new thing now, God. Now, when it springs up, I'm going to be ready for it. I am going to perceive it because I know that you make a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So I'm going to be ready for it this time, God. I'm going to be prepared for it this time, God. Mm, Another good part here. Sometimes the enemy wants to drag along with you, almost like an anchor behind you. Can you imagine just like pulling an anchor behind you everywhere you go? That would get horribly tiring. And I wouldn't want to sleep in bed with an anchor. But that, can can, can you imagine that? Like actually just dragging the enemy along behind you when you could just cut it off, right? Or you could just take the backpack off, right? That's, That's the feeling of freedom. But sometimes we do that. We drag it with us. But imagine if that enemy was snuffed out extinguished and never to rise again. We would not have to put on that yoke of burdensome, right? We could live in that life of freedom. Verse 20. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, right? Now look at this. Okay. God takes something that is not and turns it into something that is, right? God takes something that is not and turns it into something that is. It was wilderness. Why? Because there was no water. It was wasteland. Why? Because there was no water. Was there ever a day in your life that you were a wasteland? You were without living water. Was ever a day you were a wilderness, you were without living water, right? You see, when it was a wilderness, because there was no water, and when it was a wasteland, because there was no water, no community could be built on that, right? A community couldn't be built where there was no water. So when they talk about building a community, Back in like the Old Testament, when they would build cities, right? And we'll talk about a city on a hill here in just a second. When they would build a community, why would they build the community there? Because there was water there and because there was really good fertile ground really close by to it. You didn't have cars. You couldn't go, you know, an hour away, two hours away, 60 miles, 120 miles to go do something, right? They had to make sure they built their city where they had the resources to provide for their people, right? So then the city would be built there and then there would be other villages that would be around that. That's where the uh, people with less, uh, the people that just didn't have enough to live in the city would live. They were called daughters. Daughter villages is what they were called. Now the city was the place where they had everything though, right? And it had to be built around the water and it had to be built around fertile ground, So how did you get a city on a hill? Well, you would get a city on a hill when the initial city would get destroyed or the initial city would get, uh, somebody would come attack it and destroy it and there wouldn't be anything left. It was just rubble. They would cover it up with dirt and then they would build a new city on top of it. 
Okay, and when that would happen again, they would on top and on top and on top. And it would just keep rebuilding itself. It would just keep reloading itself, right? Because they were already in the fertile ground. They couldn't just leave and build a city somewhere else because they, they took so much time to build the city right there because the ground around it was so good. Oh, come on, that ground around in your life is so good. Right, so just when you are down and out, just when you think that one thing that you did was so terrible and you can't rebound from it, you can't reload from it, think again, because God created you to be a city on a hill. And you are a city on a hill. You just got to believe that you're in a a city on a hill because that one time you got destroyed, like your city fell down, your walls fell down on your city and you thought you were destroyed because the enemy said something to you or the enemy did something to you to destroy you. That's when your city got leveled, but it got rebuilt. And then it got rebuilt again. And it just keeps getting rebuilt until you are this city on a hill surrounded by resources. Come on, that's good stuff. Verse 20, we're still there. Verse 20. Oh, this is my favorite part. Because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Are you a wasteland or a wilderness looking for water? Do you need your thirst to be quenched? All you got to do is finish the verse. Because it says to give drink to my people, my chosen. Yep, chose you. Yep, he chose you to give drink to you because you are a chosen one to quench your thirst, to reload you for this time that you are living in right now. 21. The people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. He formed you for himself to praise him. Check it out. It's just like Brandon said. He's all up in the notes today in verse 21 here. God created you to praise him, to worship him, to sing to him, right? That's why worship is so important. We'll get to do it one more time before we leave. Make worship so important today. Make worship something that you live by, right? Something that just empties out your soul, that cleans you out to make you that person that is ready to be reloaded for the next step, the next journey, the next adventure that God has in your life. Unleash your praise to him because he wants to reload you so you can be the one who provides the living water to those who are lost in the wasteland or lost in the wilderness. Just like we discussed back in verse 20. Maybe that was you back then. Maybe somebody gave you some living water. You know, that song we sang this morning, A Coat of Many Colors, you do realize that you have a coat of many colors. Do you know what a coat of many colors was? It meant that uh, uh, Joseph wore one. And it meant that he was the favored son. And that was weird because he wasn't actually the firstborn. But it meant that he was the favored son. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Jesus has given each one of us a coat of many colors to wear. And I wear my coat everywhere I go because I want the world to know that I'm walking out Jesus in my life, right? I don't want them to have to know by me saying anything. I want them to just be able to see it, not see it because I am better than them or anybody else is better than them, but so that I am an example for those that say, Whatever that is, I want that. I I just, I want that. Let's move to Isaiah 44, verse 1. Yeah, there we go. I love to read this part like God is actually talking to me, okay? Like we talked about last week or two weeks ago, I can't remember when it was, but um, put yourself in the shoes in the story, all right? So just hop out of there, hop in their shoes, and then read the story like you're standing in the story listening to it, okay? Here we go. But now listen, Jacob, my servant. He's talking to you, okay? He's talking to you. But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, 
whom I have chosen. Want to hear God's voice audibly? Yeah, I kind of do. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Uh, read your Bible out loud. All right. Just read it out loud and listen to it. And, that, and it just it doesn't get any better than that. Anybody ever heard God's voice audibly out loud? Good. Good. I have heard God's voice audibly one time. It was actually in a dream. Um, he said, I will blow up a dust so you can see me. And I saw Jesus from about the waist down. And it was actually in the dust of a sandstorm. And that was the only thing God has actually audibly spoken to me was in that dream. And that dream was about eight years ago, 10 years ago, somewhere right in there. Where were we? But now, yeah, okay, yeah, go on. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. He's still talking to you. I'm just reading your Bible here. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid, Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, who I have chosen. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. If you just read it, it's good, but we're going to break it down a little bit. He made you and he's talking to you. Okay, do you remember what Jacob means? Jacob actually means deceiver, while Jeshurun means upright one. So don't be afraid if you are a Jacob, because he's going to, he wants to turn you into an upright one, right? Come on, that's good news. So even if you are stuck in that pit, even if you are down and out and struggling in that moment right there, he wants to raise you up to be an upright one. All right? Amen. That's good news to hear right there. Verse 3. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit it's Holy Spirit, on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Now, who's ready for God to reload and refresh our lives and bring new life to the things around you on the dry ground in your life? Come on, who's, got, who's ready for God to actually pour that out on your life, on that dry ground? Maybe in your life right now, you have some dry, cracked ground around you that just needs some water, that just needs some refreshing, that just needs some reloading. And you're saying, God, I just want you to pour out this water, this living water on my life around me and just make it flourish, God. God, just make it flourish. Now, I want you to understand, God doesn't always make it flourish in finances, okay? That's not what God is about. Does God talk about money a lot? Yeah, It does. If you read the Bible, it talks about money quite a bit, but that's not everything to God. That's, we made that everything in our 21st century mindset. Money is what success is built off of in an earthly mindset. Man, that's not a godly mindset. Now, I'm not saying you can't be wealthy, right? That's not a bad thing, but it can be bad in the ways that you use it. Okay, wealth is not inherently bad. God talks a lot about wealth, actually, and building wealth, correct? Uh, Financially and spiritually wealth. Now, it's not a bad thing to build that up, but you have to use it in the right ways. Okay, come on, let's keep going. God knows where to water in your life, but sometimes you pour the water in the wrong places. So rely on him to know where the water needs to be poured at, right? He, who, like, like who is actually ready to have streams of flowing water in their life? Like that's kind of stagnant right now that is actually ready for God to just pour it out and have a stream of flowing water in your life. And it also says an amazing thing. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. And if any of you in here are wondering, hey, they're talking about Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Yes. The Holy Spirit was totally in the Old Testament. 86 times, actually, it's mentioned in the Old Testament. Oh, and by the way, uh, your kids are blessed, okay? So just in case you missed that part in the beginning, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So just in case you're wondering, you're concerned, yes, guess what? Your kids are blessed as well. On to the next one. 
right? This is good news right here. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Okay, you ready for the parallel verses to this one? Let's plug these in. Psalms 1, 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. Remember the verse we just talked about, right? That one was Isaiah 44, 4. This is the parallel verse to it. And there's going to be another one too. So get ready. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. What happens when you're a tree planted by a stream of living water or flowing water? It yields fruit, leaves don't wither, and whatever they do prosper. Like we just talked about earlier. Don't take this in a financial aspect, okay? Because God doesn't always prosper you in a financial uh, aspect of life. It might be something completely different. Don't miss it. Don't expect to know where God is going to work, okay? Be ready to see and perceive it where God is going to work, and then you can jump into it. Now, this doesn't talk exactly about pruning, but we're kind of like stepping on some of the grounds that Jess had talked about um, with uh, like being a tree and being planted and being close to a stream of living water, right? Now let's go on to, there's one more I want to touch on here. It's Jeremiah 17, 8. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. Now imagine this. Put yourself in this story again. Imagine yourself right here, okay? Imagine yourself. This is you. You will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out your roots by the stream. You don't fear when heat comes. Your leaves are always green. You have no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Right, that's, that's impressive. That's empowering. If that's you, you know, you just threw your shoes into that, put your life right into that tree, right? And if you think this is a passage about a tree, read it about yourself. You will be like a tree planted by water. You will send out your roots by the stream. Who doesn't fear when the heat comes? I don't fear when the heat comes. When the enemy comes, when the haters come, because I know where I'm at. I know whose I am. And I don't fear when that heat comes because my leaves are green, because I know where I'm at. I know who I'm by. I don't have any worries in a year of drought because I know that he is going to provide for me. So I don't fail to bear fruit. I'm going to keep bearing fruit even when it's dry, even when I don't feel like God's talking to me right now. I'm going to keep bearing fruit because I know that water is coming back through again because I trust that he is good. Amen? That's good. That's good. And if that is you, if I just described you in a nutshell, don't move from where you're at because you are right by that stream of the living water that you are looking for, right? Your roots are in there. Don't move from where you are at. Even when the world presses against you, even when the world presses against you and you're the one standing by that stream, even when every situation seems to be impossible, right? Even when there seems to be no hope, don't ever fail to bear fruit, right? This is what I pray for each and every one of you guys, that you can reload. Maybe you're not the one that's by that stream right now. Maybe you're the one that's out in the wasteland. Maybe you're the one that's out in the desert. And you say, God, it's time. It's time for me to come closer to that stream. It's time for me to walk closer to that stream because whatever living water that is, whatever living water I've seen and that person that I walked by today, God, that is what I want. And I want to walk closer to that stream and I just want to sit by that stream and I want to put my roots in that stream. 
because I want to live my life for you, God. And I want to worship you today and always for the rest of my life because I'm not put on this earth for my pleasure. I'm put on this earth to do your work, God. Right? That is my prayer for you guys and for myself. Who are you surrounding yourself with? One more thing to touch on. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Are you surrounding yourself with the people that are building you up or tearing you down? Are you surrounding yourself that are making positive, are you surrounding yourself with people that are making positive impacts in your life or wanting to make negative impacts in your life? Right? You're surrounded by people that are going to lift you higher and encourage you to do greater things for the kingdom of God. Or are you surrounding yourself by people who are going to pull you down and say, no, just live with, live with pleasure. Just live here while you're here. Live in the moment while you're here right now. Or are you going to say, I, I can't do that because I'm standing so close to the stream of living water that my roots are here. My leaves are green. You can pull one of my leaves off and you can look at it, but you're not going to tear the tree down. You're not going to cut this tree down because I am too close. My roots are too far into this stream that I'm not going anywhere. This is a good example, and I like this one. Anybody know what a foxhole is? A foxhole is like a military dugout that became popular in World War I. Now, in a foxhole, it's dug by a shovel. It's not a big trench, but it's a hole for protection to provide you pr protection from what? From the enemy. And only about three people can fit in there, maybe four. So as we're talking about you being surrounded and who you're surrounding yourself by, I'm going to ask you this. Who's in your foxhole? Because if you're in your foxhole, that means you're ready to go into battle, right? They just didn't, when they got into a foxhole, they just didn't pretend. No, they were preparing for a battle. Like they were preparing for the enemy, which if you believe in spiritual warfare, you should be preparing for the enemy, right? So you should be preparing your foxhole for yourself and those surrounding you. So who is going to be in your foxhole? You know, I've really found out over the last like six months to a year, those people that are actually in my foxhole who are ready to go into battle with me, whether that's for myself or whether that's for one of them. I could list some of those people that are going to be in my foxhole, but I could also list some of those people when I peek over the edge of that foxhole and I say, the enemy's coming. You're ready for battle? And I turn around, and there's nobody there. They retreated. They got scared. They were afraid. They weren't close enough to that living water. They weren't close enough to that stream, right? So I'm going to ask you today, who is in your foxhole? Is it people you trust? Is it people that you are ready to go to battle with? Is it people that you know that will battle with you in a moment in your life when you need them, when the enemy's coming, when the heat is there? Right? Who is in your foxhole? While you are reloading yourself, make sure your friends are also reloading themselves to prepare for the next round of battle. All right? Spiritual warfare is real. And it's hard. It's really hard. Don't do it alone, okay? If that's one of you that says, you know, I can do it, I can handle this, don't try it. It's hard. It's hard to handle it on your own. Have people that can battle with you. Have people in your foxhole that are ready for you. So as we get close to a close here, I want to remind you why God has created you. God has created you to be people for his kingdom, to be people to add more people to his kingdom, right? We are called to love people. We're called to love people. And God wants everybody he can in his kingdom with him. And guess what? That's why he created you. So come on. Are you planting yourself today by that stream of living water? Are you ready to walk out of that wilderness or that wasteland that you might be in right now? And say, I just want to put my feet in that water. And I just want to stand there. I want to stand there forever, God. Is that you today? Let's bow our heads in prayer. 
Father, we thank you so much for everybody that's here today. We thank you for everybody that has heard your word, God. Father, I pray that we can just be people of the text. I pray that we can just be people that digs into your word deeper and deeper and deeper, looking for understanding, looking for reason, just looking for ways to further our lives with you, God. Father, I just pray that we can be planted by that stream of water, that stream of living water that our God only provides, that Jesus provides, Father. God, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you in this day, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.